Okay, so today we're talking about the four lobes of the brain, uh, the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes. Got to know each one of them and what specific functions are located in each one of them. Something that will absolutely be popping up on the AP Psych test. So, um, we have these four different lobes you can see over here on the left. Uh, if you are do, filling out your outer sections of the brain chart, you recognize all these different um, portions of the brain. And you can tell them apart based on these kind of like thicker, dark lines. Um, and these are types of fissures. And if we actually had a brain, right, so you could look, put your hands on like an anatomy lab and you could see that you'd be rec you could recognize um, that it isn't just like one big surface. It's actually split up into these different lobes based on these different fissures. You don't need to know what they are, where you find those, but um, know that it is broken up into those lobes, left side and right side. So if you flip it either way, you're going to have an front, a frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal lobe. And you do need to know where those are located. Okay. So four lobes, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. Mostly, if you're thinking of just like the biggest of big ideas for those, uh, frontal is the probably the most important one. Remember, it's what creates our personality and who we are. Um, it doesn't do as much with like sensation. It does a lot, however, with movement. Um, our motor cortex is located here, but very much just like our conscious movement. Um, speaking is also located in the frontal lobe, but like problem solving, analytical thought, um, personality, all of that located in our frontal lobe. Moving to the parietal lobe, um, the is our feeling or somatosensory cortex is located there. So like a lot of our sensory neurons connect back to here. The occipital lobe is our visual cortex back in the back. Um, it's where we have because where our vision is processed on the sides. It's easy to remember because it's closest to our ears um, or you can think of tempo. The temporal lobes is where our hearing or audio cortex is located. It's where we process sound. So all of those um, other things that you should recognize is that I mentioned this a little bit, but within those lobes, you need to know like kind of how they break down, what the importance of this, them is. Uh, so frontal lobe, we're called, it has the motor cortex. Um, it also has Broca's area. So it's something, both of these can certainly pop up on the test. Uh, motor cortex is, controls our ability to move our body consciously. Um, and remember, as well, things we'll talk about hemispheres in 2.5, but um, these hemispheres control the opposite side of the body. So your left hemisphere, that's what we're looking at. Motor cortex would control your right arm or your right side of your body. Broca's area um, is an important language production portion of the brain. So uh, this is what gives us that ability to do that. Over here, we've got the somatosensory cortex and the parietal lobe, uh, which gives us the ability to feel, again, on the opposite side of our body, visual cortex, um, auditory cor cortex. And within that temporal lobe, we also have Wernicke's area, um, or Wernicke's area, technically. Um, and that is language comprehension, the ability to understand. And we're going to talk a little bit about aphasia um, as we get into this. So starting with the frontal lobe, again, this one's the most complex. It's the most human. Um, it's, we are ultima it's ultimately a, an association creation machine. All of learning is creating associations between different things to some extent. Um, so uh, looking at other animals, they don't have a lot of these. Right. Cats, a rat, like have barely any. Um, their uh, associations they're creating are like purely for evolutionary purposes. Chimpanzees have a lot more, much closer to ours. But a big thing that makes humans as, you know, maybe the most evolved species on the planet um, is that we have the most association area, the most area within our brains for us to process and create new inf new associations and to learn things. Um, so uh, these are different areas within our cortex that allow us to uh, process more information, to have these higher mental functions like learning, memory, speaking, thinking. Um, these aren't associated with things like motor or sensory neurons. Okay? And it is a, a huge part of our, uh, our cerebral cortex, 75%. Um, this is the big reason why just mapping out the brain, we can't do like we can with like the chambers of a heart and stuff like that. Um, we can't just like replace a brain, a brain transplant, because these are different for everyone. Right. Everyone has a different um, their associations are wired differently. Remember, when you're over the course of your childhood and adulthood, even your brain is constantly building itself. It's constantly creating new neural networks. And so uh, these are individuals. Right. For us, each one of us has our own. I mean, just think about the story of Jody, the girl who had her right hemisphere removed. 
um, her left side is going to look wildly different than everyone else's because her association areas had to pick up the slack and do a lot of the work. Um, good, good, good. Okay, so frontal lobe, other stuff that it does, if we're going to spreading it out, the prefrontal area or prefrontal cortex, this is where that like, um, so the uh, personality is built. I mean, who we are is kind of located here. Remember uh, Phineas Gage, when he took a steel beam through that, his personality drastically changed. Uh, behind that, we've got our premotor and motor cortexes, motor areas. That's where most motor neurons in the neural network work back to, the ability for us to consciously control and move our body. Um, and, and then located right around here, you've got Broca's area in the left hemisphere only important to note that you can see questions like he has damage to the left side of his head and then reports trouble hearing um, or trouble processing information or trouble speaking um, and you'll recognize that oh left side having trouble speaking that's going to be Broca's area right so you got to be able to know what side each one of them is on so prefrontal cortex um, is where planning comes from our personality problem solving it's how we focus uh, decision making our morals and ethics all of that comes back to here the ability to control our impulses the ability to put off rewards um, and not not like basically don't be an animal and immediately eat the food recognize that like I shouldn't eat those sweets even though I want to um, animals can't really do that Right. If you put all if you just if I just put all the food in the world out on the floor, uh, Patrick would get really fat. Right. If we fed him treats all day, he's never going to be like, well, you know, I know I shouldn't. I'm putting on a little weight. He wouldn't do that. Um, so uh, impulse control is a very much prefrontal issue or prefrontal control kind of thing. Um, and our interaction with other humans. A lot of that is located here. Our social behaviors. Baroka's area um, also on the left side in that. Uh, the frontal lobe is how we produce language. Um, right? This is something that humans do that a lot of other animals don't do nearly as complexly. Right? They do a very basic forms of communication, um, a lot of it very much bodily language. But for humans, we produce language in a very complex level with tens of thousands of words in our vocabulary and structures that are extremely complex. Uh, but it's effortless. Right? We effortless do, effortlessly do this because we have this part of our brain that has evolved to do that. Um, but that can also be a major issue if that is damaged. Um, I, I recommend um, for those who get a chance, uh, this PowerPoint's on Classroom, go check it out. A lot of these videos are really, really useful. Unfortunately, they don't work when I'm um, posting lectures this way, but really, really fascinating stuff of people that had damage to Broca's area or Wernicke's area. And they have a, they, they perfectly understand speech. It would be, I can't imagine having this kind of problem um, or this kind of um of and being able to totally understand everyone around you you know everything they're saying but when you try to respond your words are garbled your words don't make any sense so you can't really respond appropriately or you're trying to form the words and you can't find them um and you're you can maybe only use like one syllable at a time or one word even though you know what you want to say you've got the images of it of your, in your head you've got like maybe even the words of it in your head you can't get them out right you can't say them um, so it would almost be like being trapped um, in your own mind to some extent. I had an aunt that had a stroke. That's the most common way that damage to this happens. Um, and listening to her talk about those experiences and hearing her talk about how difficult it was. She, someone that was a college professor um, and trying to be able to talk about um, what things that she cared about or any of the, the topics or books she was reading and the inability to do that because of her damage to her Broca's area is, it was extremely, extremely hard for her. So Broca's area is how we produce language is in the left hemisphere and the frontal lobe. Also in the frontal lobe, that motor cortex, important to note um, those kind of gyrus that we have, these little like um, succus, these little bitty piece, uh, basically like all that space of that outer cerebral cortex. Uh, the more space it's dedicated to, the larger cortex area equals more fine motor control. A ton of space is dedicated to our hands, um, to our face, to our tongue, to our mouths because we need a lot of control over that think about the wonders of language and how that wouldn't be possible without an extremely adroit mouth right we can easily uh, form our lips to say words like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious right like we can say that without a lot of effort um, because our tongues and our mouth can 
work together precisely to say what we want. Our hands are incredibly, incredibly um, adroit and flexible. And we can do what we want with like these, these 10 different fingers. Uh, we can all have them work independently or together. We have all that control, right? But think about like your attempts to like, if you were to try to do things with your elbows, right? Like how much control do you have over that? Not nearly as much. It means there's not as much space located there. So um, that motor cortex uh, is dedicated to our ability to move around these different parts of our body. And you can see that here, right? Like different amount of space, large amount of space given to the hand, um, large amount of space given to the different parts of the face, because that's how we form, um, form words. It's how we communicate things like that. Um, let's see, and this is a, a classic, like, uh, psychology statue and thinking that if we were proportional to the amount of space our brain had, this is what we would look like. Right, would be primarily hands and mouth because that's where so much of our cortex is dedicated to because those are the most complex and most difficult to move. And so we need more space in our brain to do that. This should make it even more impressive for you thinking about um, the fact that young Jody, the three-year-old girl, her left hemisphere does it all. Right. Remember that she struggles to, to move her left hand, um, but she was able to do that. Uh, her left left hemisphere picked up the slack enough to figure out how to do it at a basic level. Right? Incredible. So um, that's the frontal lobe. The second is the parietal lobe. This one is our senses, somatosensory cortex. So we process sensation information from across the body. All of it happens here. Remember, the thalamus is where it happens first. It comes from those afferent neurons uh, through that peripheral nervous system into the thalamus, which then processes it and sends it to the somatosensory cortex. Okay, so it works closely with the motor cortex, things uh, like for us to respond uh, to those sensations, but um, all of those senses also come to the somatosensory cortex. So remember, like the questions that we talked about with people that had damage and couldn't do any of their senses, but they could still smell. That's the thalamus. The somatosensory cortex handles all of those, right? So it's actually the like conscious processing of those. Um, and there's there's some fascinating things that come out of this as well, like phantom limb syndrome, um, in which our somatosensory cortex, uh, because someone lost a limb, the somatosensory cortex is still working, right? It still thinks that that is still there. So whenever like people respond that they lost a leg or an arm for some reason, they respond still feeling pain in those areas. They respond, uh, they report that they still um, like oftentimes have aches and cramps in those things. They'll say like they have a Charlie horse and a leg they don't have because their somatosensory cortex is still kind of firing as if it did at times or it can get confused about different input and things that happen. Next, we move to the back, the occipital lobe. This one you should think of as vision. It's all, I think it's easier to do this because it's like, think about the vision coming through the eyes and going straight to the back of the head, almost like a projector. Uh, the visual cortex. Um, this is the um, kind of the map of what that looks like, right? We've got information coming in to those eyes, going through the thalamus, uh, ultimately working their way back to that occipital lobe. Um, each hemisphere processes visual input from the opposite visual field in each eye. So I know that's a little confusing, um, but basically like the right, both eyes are processing two different types of information. Right? And then those two types of information are split and come back to the occipital lobe. Right? So um, like the, uh, for instance, the left occipital lobe, what it's really looking at is the right portion of your field of vision. And both eyes are picking that up, but that information from both eyes is working its way back to the left side of your hemisphere, your left hemisphere. So both of the eyes are seeing everything, right? Your left and right eye are both picking up the information from the left side of their visual field of view, but that information travels through both eyes to the thalamus back to the right side. Um, another interesting piece of uh, the kind of outcome for this, this is super rare, but this idea of this thing called blind sight, um, in which people's, their occipital lobe is still processing all its, or sorry, their vision is still being processed effectively. The thalamus is still working. Their eyes are still pulling that information in, but their occipital lobe is damaged and they can't process the information. Their visual cortex doesn't allow them to recognize what they're seeing. And so they're functionally blind. They have no idea what they're seeing. The world is dark for them. Uh, but if you were to throw something at their face, they would dodge it perfectly. It's crazy. 
right? If people were about to walk into a door, they'll step out of the way, right? Because they still have reflexes, right? Whenever their body is reacting to things, um, they can basically, in, to some extent, like tell you what, they're, what they think is around them, um, what they're kind of sensing around them. Um, and it's not just the, uh, it's not just their enhanced vision or in hearing and smell. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, they literally can see, they just can't process that information. So they think they can't, right? So they effectively can't, they can't consciously process it, but, um, they are still able to like react to things around them. Finally, the temporal lobe, that's on the side of our head. It's the one that is going to do mo have the most association with hearing or auditory cortex. Cortex processes auditory info from the opposite ear. And uh, within that, we have Wernicke's area uh, for language compre comprehension, the ability to recognize speech. So again, Broca's and Wernicke's are both dealing with speech. Uh, Wernicke's is the ability to comprehend it. Makes sense. It's in the temporal or hearing lobe. Um, and Broca's is in our one where we interact with others. So the ability to speak to people, right? Here's Broca's area and here's Wernicke's area. Um, we also, interestingly enough, on the right side of our face, have this piece called the fusiform gyrus. Uh, this is a specific part that is focused on facial recognition. Um, Jody, the girl that had a right side hemisphere removed, reported the inability to, to recognize faces. She didn't recognize her parents for the first couple of days, but her body adapted. It figured it out. Recognize that it couldn't do that, and if she began to form new associations. Um, for adults that have this damage later in life, they aren't able to. A um, couple of things. Temporal lobe is also one of the main causes of epilepsy. Um, TLE is the most common form of temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, and we can, because within this, have all kinds of weird surface or auras, um, these like hallucinations that are appearing uh, because of damages within the temporal lobe. Probably don't need to know that, but another kind of abnormal piece. Um, Wernicke's area, especially interesting. Again, I would watch these videos just to recognize signs of this um, within the left hemisphere language comprehension. And if that's damaged, um, it's even worse than if Broca's area is damaged because you can't really process information when it comes in. But at the same time, you can't understand your own speech when you're releasing it. But you can really say words totally fine. So if you watch this video whenever you get the chance, um, they're talking to this man at a conference and asking him questions, uh, and he's just saying words. He sounds totally normal. He's just like smiling and waving and saying stuff, uh, but it's just a random word vomit of words. Um, and it's really sad thinking about it because they can't really understand what people are saying, um, and what they're saying doesn't make any sense because they can't process their own language. They can't. They just can't process it. So uh, they can produce some language, but they're, they can produce totally effective sounding language, but it's not put together in effective sentences. It doesn't make any sense. Broca's has a better chance to do that even than Wernicke does. Um, and finally, damage to that fusiform face area, uh, we can get face blindness. This idea that you cannot recognize faces, including your own. If you looked in the mirror, you wouldn't know that it was you. Uh, you would be like, oh. That's what I look like. Weird. I don't, I guess that's me, but I didn't know that's what I looked like. Um, it's literally, we have a specific section of our brain that is geared towards remembering faces. Because think about things, how important that is as humans. It's important for survival. If we know that there's a specific person that wants to kill us um, a thousand years ago and we see their face, we need to remember that instead of being like, huh, there's a person, right? We need to realize that and, and be worried about that. Or if there's friendly people, we should recognize them and say, oh, good, a friend. Um, so we have faces, we have, uh, or brains that are adapted uh, to give us the ability to recognize faces. And then really interesting, cap gas syndrome, um, in which a, there's damage between the amygdala and the hippocampus, um, in which people can um, recognize faces, but they are devoid of all emotion in seeing faces, and they assume people are imposters. Right? It's kind of, it's a crazy one, right? It's like people will literally see someone, their own parent, and they'll think they're an imposter. And there used to be all these like Freudian explanations of it, but there's a very biological explanation is that they, the, basically their amygdala and their um, hippocampus are severed. So they can no longer connect their emotions to their memories. And so they say, I know that's my mother. I know that's what she looks like, but I don't feel anything for her. And that's wrong because a lot of what we're doing, a lot of what we're remembering, a lot of our memories are very emotional in nature. 
when we see people's faces, we immediately be like, oh, I like that person. Or be like, man, I do not like that person. We oftentimes associate emotions with them. That's why the amygdala and the hippocampus are so tightly connected. All right. So that's it for the portions of the brain. Um, all of those lobes, make sure that you learn them. There's a lot of stuff. Finish up your brain chart. And until next time, um, much, much love.